Oh, hello there. This is Let's Talk About Myths, baby. And I am your host, Liv. There are very few Greek myths that I don't know with at least a decent amount of detail at this point. Even if the nitty gritty details don't stay in my head forever, I'm pretty proud of how many myths I at least know like the idea behind, the basic story, or even if I can't tell you the whole thing off the top of my head, I know some of it. The myth of Hero and Leander though, man, turns out I had actually no idea what it was about. Hero and Leander is one of those stories that I knew the names of, knew the names super well, and so completely assumed that I just knew the story itself, or that it was something I would recognize immediately as I began to read the sources. But nope. Actually, the story of Hero and Leander is fascinating for a whole host of reasons, but I would argue very few of those reasons are actually found in the ancient sources that survive. That part is ultimately what interests me. I finally decided to look into this myth because of this week's upcoming conversation episode. On Friday, you'll hear me speaking with Professor Karen Carr, who has just written a book on the history of swimming. And so she came on the show to talk about Hero and Leander and swimming. Swimming, though, so far beyond Hero and Leander and into the wider world and the Mediterranean and beyond. It's really fascinating. I'm excited for you to listen to that episode. But today... Today, I'm giving you the background, the Hero and Leander background, at least. The story of Hero and Leander as it appears in the ancient surviving sources and a bit beyond, because there are not many ancient surviving sources. But just before we dive too deep, a reminder that the episodes you're listening to in May and June and even some of July have been pre-recorded. This is a real thrill for me because I am literally never this prepared and always scrambling and always trying to find a way to be prepared and not scrambling. So far, I'm only able to force my brain to do it when a trip to Greece is at stake, but still, it's satisfying. But that is all to say, I don't know, if something horrific has happened in the meantime in the world and you don't hear me mentioning it or standing up for people who need standing up for something like I would normally, this is why. It's weird recording this far into the future because it means I find myself with very little to say by way of introduction, but also I enjoy the introductions. So here we are with this slightly rambling explanation that probably wasn't necessary at all. Hero and Leander, though, what makes these two almost a household name? What is their story? And how did they get so famous? This is episode 170. Leander swam far beyond the ancient world, the stormy story of Hero and Leander. Before we dive into the story itself, I have to explain to you all what makes the story of Hero and Leander not only somewhat unique, but also particularly tricky to deal with on my end. The origins of the story of Hero and Leander are Greek. That much we seem to know. It is and was an ancient Greek myth. But while our earliest surviving text source is Ovid... In fact, in the ancient world, there are very few surviving text sources for this story at all. We have Ovid's Heroides, we have this brief and unnamed reference in Virgil's Georgics, and a 6th century CE Greek poet named Musaeus, who wrote an epic poem. We don't have any classical Greek sources, but we do know it was a story from that period. Their names were known as early as like the 5th or the 6th centuries BCE. It is an ancient Greek myth without any ancient Greek source. Because that's the fun of working with the ancient world. We also know it was a common subject for ancient art. Among other examples, there is a wall painting found in Pompeii that shows their story. So if it was popular enough to feature into a random person's home in Pompeii, it had to have been a pretty common story. And yet, all we have is Ovid. And not Ovid's Metamorphoses, even, but his Heroides. 
And not even his standard heroities, but his double heroities, which I'll get to. But frankly, this makes it a tricky story to parse actual details from. Because as you all probably well know by now, Ovid's heroities are letters written between mythological characters. In the case of Hero and Leander, like I said, they're part of the double heroities, which there are only three sets, and it's even debated whether Ovid wrote them. <laughs> the double heroities are these pairs of letters written between lovers, like Hero and Leander and Paris and Helen, and then two I don't even know. <laughs> I'm going to cover those later. Rather than like these singular letters of the regular heroities, which are typically by women to shitty men of myth, like Ariadne to Theseus, Medea to Jason. And you just know I'm me, so not to worry. Next Friday, I will be reading you the Heroides. So you get to have the full effect. But today, we're trying to parse the details of the actual story and to look at how and why it became a nearly household name, given the lack of ancient sources. Because that in itself fascinates me. But we'll get there. Leander is a young man from Abydos on the Hellespont. Hero is a young woman from Sestos, on the other side of the Hellespont. Now, the Hellespont. The Hellespont is what we would now call the Dardanelles, the strait in modern Turkey that connects the Black Sea with the Mediterranean. It also separates the Asian side of Turkey with the European side of Turkey, since that country, the modern country, spans the two continents. In the ancient Greek world, it was called the Hellespont, the Sea of Hella. From a myth I think I've told you before, but where a woman named Hella falls from the famed golden ram as she was riding it to safety with her twin brother Phrixus. The bit of the sea where she fell was then named for her. But what matters today is simply, there is a bit of sea between these two cities of Abydos and Sestos. The sea is called the Hellespont, and on the one side lives Leander, and the other, Hero. But the cities aren't enemies. They've just got this water in between them. Some things, though, can bring the cities together. So a festival of Aphrodite is held, uniting the whole region and bringing travelers from all over the eastern Mediterranean. Everyone gathers there in Sestos, and there, Hero and Leander meet, and they fall in love. Fast. They fall deep in love very fast because they're young, and young love is a powerful drug, if Shakespeare has taught us anything. Hero and Leander fall in love, but it isn't as easy as just being together. No, see, Hero had already become a priestess of Aphrodite, and thus she wasn't permitted to marry, let alone fall in love. She was a priestess of Aphrodite, and that is even how they met. She was part of the festival that brought Leander over from Abydos, and that's how he first saw her. But that same reason keeps them apart, because as in any good and sure-to-be-tragic love story, there has to be some important reason that the couple can't be together. This is theirs. Not only is there a body of water between their two cities, but on top of that, Hero is a priestess. Their love has to remain secret. But of course, they're young and in love, so while it remains secret, it certainly doesn't stop entirely. Instead, the pair begin to get together in secret in the night. Hero would steal off away from her parents as early as she could, and she would hide out in a tower at the edge of the sea. And there, Hero would hold a lamp to her window, lighting the way. She was Leander's lighthouse. Leander, on the other side of the water, would swim. He would set out as soon as he could, looking for that light across the water in the darkness and using it to guide his way. With Hero guiding him both literally and metaphorically, Leander would swim across the Hellespont to Hero every night. Every night he swims over to her, braving the dark waters, braving the dark waters because he can see her light in the distance. 
And so every night they get to spend together in secret, but oh, so very much in love. Hero and Leander continue on like this for some time. Every night, Hero holds her lamp to the window, and every night, Leander follows her light as he swims the waters of the Hellespont, which is not a short distance, by the way. It's tough to say exactly where he was swimming, but I think the shortest distance we're looking at is, at the very, very least, a kilometer. That is quite the swim to be taking in the pitch dark, with only a lamp in the far distance to guide you. That and your love. But Leander does it because Hero and Leander are just so very much in love that he's willing to risk it all for her. One night, though, the conditions are different. There's a storm and the waters are not calm or smooth. They're rough and dangerous. It's darker even in the stormy weather than it is normally. Leander hesitates, looking out at the conditions of that night. Should he risk it? Will he be able to navigate the long swim in the rough waves and the rain and the wind? He thinks about it. He writes a letter to Hero even, telling her his thoughts and feelings as he faces this weather and wonders whether he should see her that night. That's one of Ovid's heroities. You'll hear it next week. Leander goes back and forth, wondering whether it's a good idea or not, but he can't imagine not seeing Hero, even for a single night. And Hero can't imagine not seeing him. They've been doing this for so long, their affection for each other has only grown. Now it's a habit, and habits are tough to break. So in the end, Leander decides he's going to risk it. He knows the route. He's done it so many times. He always has Hero's light to guide him. And even though the waters will be rougher, the weather will be worse, the rain will be coming down hard, he will have Hero's light to guide him through the waters. He will have her love to guide him through the waters. He just can't imagine a night without seeing her. Leander sets out, as he always does, doing his best to ignore the rush of the waters and the pounding of the rain. As he always does, he focuses on that light in the distance and reminds himself that Hero is waiting for him on the other side. It will all be worth it when he reaches her, because it always is. But it wasn't only Leander's route that was affected by that night's storm. It wasn't just that the waters were rougher, that the rain made it tougher for him to see the light in the distance, that the wind would chill him to the bone. The storm also extinguished Hero's lamp. Partway through Leander's swim, the swim he'd done so many times, always with Hero's light in the distance to guide his way, the light went out. The light went out and Leander got confused by the rushing waters and the waves. They threw him off his course and he didn't have Hero's light to guide him through the distance. Before Hero could relight her lamp... It was too late, and Leander had drowned in the Hellespont. Hero spent the night worrying over Leander. He didn't arrive at her door when he always did, sopping wet but always smiling. She waited for him all night, but he never arrived, and she worried about the moment that her lamp had gone out. When morning finally comes to her in her tower, she looks out the window at the beach below, at the Hellespont that Leander always swam for her, and there he was, lying broken 
at the water's edge. Seeing Leander there and knowing that he had died, and that he had died at least in part because her lamp had gone out and he was searching for her, the thing that he trusted would guide him safely across the waters had failed at her hand. Hero threw herself from her tower toward the beach below, where Leander lay. And so there she too died, next to Leander, at the edge of the Hellespont. And that is the whole story of Hero and Leander. It is short and sweet and tragic and sad. But for all it is short and sweet and tragic, what interests me is what it became hundreds of years later. First, though, let's, let's look a bit more at this story in the ancient world. We know that the story existed, at least in part, many hundreds of years before our earliest source, Ovid's Heroides. It's possible, probably likely, that it was a local story told in that region of the Hellespont that eventually it found its way into Greek mythology and then later into the Roman Ovid's rendition of Greek mythology. So it's always referred to as Greek, which I find so interesting because from what I found, there are no explicit references to it as a story from the Greek world. Still, I think it's likely I'm missing something because it's also very hard to track down the ancient bits of this story because of what it later becomes which we'll get to. But in terms of these ancient sources, we have Ovid's Heroides from the first century BCE. Their story is, like I said, what a part of what we call the double Heroides. These are companion letters between two people rather than letters from one to another. They're much more romantic rather than like righteously angry. It seems there is a bit of question over authorship when it comes to these. We're going with Ovid here regardless because it's too tricky to try to piece out anything else. Still, because these are letters written from one to the other, they don't actually tell the story itself. The letters begin with Leander to Hero, where Leander is professing all of his love for her and then explaining the bad weather and whether or not he can still set out to visit her that night. Meanwhile, Hero's letter back to him is very similar, lots of professing love, and then the tragedy, where she tells him not to come to her that night because the weather is too bad and she doesn't want anything to happen to him. But we're to presume that that letter never reaches Leander and so he comes anyway. We have nothing of the way they met or really much of their relationship at all. Then, the only other detailed source for the story is this guy named Musaeus, who was writing all the way in the 6th century CE, a whole other world's worth of time. He wrote a short epic poem dedicated to this story. That poem, though, is annoyingly tricky to find in translations that are more recent than the 18th fucking century. And frankly, the 18th century translations are nearly unreadable, because it's also not super narrative-based. So I had so much trouble figuring out exactly what this source was saying. Add to that, I found some bits that seem deeply gross when it comes to Hero's virginity. So I avoided going into too much detail on that bit of the sourcing. It seems at least at, at that point, which makes sense chronologically, because by the time Musaeus was living in that, that world was deep into Christianity. So the story becomes a bit more of like a morality tale about this woman who was an avowed virgin, a priestess of Aphrodite, who then had sex. <gasps> the horror. There's also a lot about her protesting and being convinced by Leander. Ugh, which, gross. It's tough for me to say how much of that was influenced by the translation I was reading, though, because it too was made during a high point for Christian morality. But frankly, the other translations uh, that were available were all minimum $50 for only an ebook, so I cannot justify spending that in a single episode. Here we are. But so here we have the only two ancient sources, and they're like 600 years apart. And yet we understand this story to be from ancient Greek mythology many hundreds of years before Ovid wrote it down in the Heroides. You all know me well enough to know that 
that it, that's a huge part of why I'm so interested in this story. Still, what adds to the intrigue for me is just how popular this story became another thousand or so years later. Enter my almost never used source, <laughs> Wikipedia. Because while I'm not remotely skilled in researching anything from the Renaissance onward, which is what we're now moving into, thus, sorry, Wikipedia, we just gotta hope it's right. So it seems that in this time, Musaius's poem became quite popular and was maybe even believed by these people to have been much, much more ancient than it actually is. It seems it was even believed to be pre-Homeric during the Renaissance period, even possibly credited as like the quote-unquote first poem. Of course, this is all nonsense, but oh, it adds to the intrigue of where the popularity of this story comes from. Because, well, this story is then later referenced by so, so many of the most quote-unquote famous poets spanning centuries. Shakespeare, Christopher Marlowe, John Donne, John Keats, Byron. Byron even swam the Hellespont inspired by Leander. It's mentioned by Rudyard Kipling, Tennyson, Victor Hugo in Les Miserables. The story of Hero and Leander becomes this high point of romance, this example by which to compare their own romances or to just speak of in poetry, this tragic love story. It's the Romeo and Juliet before Romeo and Juliet become the Romeo and Juliet. It's this, this tragic love story to be referenced by these romantic poets. And yet it is so very, very minor in the actual ancient sources. I am just so fascinated by which stories get picked up and when and for what reason. In this case, though, there's this, this time period of authors and poets, these like, you know, quote unquote, high minded white men, <laughs> almost all British, who seem to want these tragic romances. And of course, they revere the ancient Greeks. And so there are Hero and Leander just to fit all of their needs. Huh, it's so interesting. But there's only so much to say about this myth, part of why it's so interesting to me in the first place. But, but again, but in order to round out this episode, I want to read to you one of the most iconic interpretations, and one that is much more readable than the unfortunate translation of Musaius' epic. You know, it's missing all the dark stuff about consent and coercion. Christopher Marlowe's poem, Hero and Leander, which he hadn't finished by the time of his death, but which was finished by someone else and published five years after Marlowe had died. I'll admit this poem is quite long, uh, but I wanted to read it and I wanted uh, to make the episode long enough for reasons I will explain at the end. But feel free to skip ahead if you don't want to hear me just reading a Elizabethan poem to you for the sake of it. Marlowe was, of course, a contemporary of Shakespeare. He wrote plays and everything, too. He just did not get as famous. But we love Marlowe because he famously wrote, "'Twas this the face that launched a thousand ships and burnt the towered tops of Ilium." Anyway, now I'm not going to just ramble about <laughs> Christopher Marlowe. This is Hero and Leander. On Hellespont, guilty of true love's blood, in view and opposite two cities stood, sea borderers disjoined by Neptune's might, the one Abydos, the other Sestos height. At Sestos hero dwelt, hero the fair, whom young Apollo courted for her hair, and offered as a dower his burning throne, where she could sit for men to gaze upon. The outside of her garments were of lawn, the lining purple silk with gilt stars drawn. Her wide sleeves green and bordered with a grove, where Venus in her naked glory strove. To please the careless and disdainful eyes of proud Adonis, that before her lies, 
her kirtle blue whereon was many a stain made with the blood of wretched lovers slain upon her head she wore a myrtle wreath from whence her veil reached to the ground beneath her veil was artificial flowers and leaves, whose workmanship both man and beast deceives. Many would praise the sweet smell as she passed, when t'was the odor which her breath forth cast. And there, for honey bees have sought in vain, and beat from thence have lighted there again. About her neck hung chains of pebble stone, which lightened by her neck like diamonds shone. She wore no gloves, for neither sun nor wind Would burn or parch her hands, but to her mind, Or warm or cool them, for they took delight To play upon those hands, they were so white. Bushkins of shells all silvered used she, And branched with blushing coral to the knee, Where sparrows perched of hollow pearl and gold, Such as the world would wonder to behold. Those with sweet water oft her handmaid fills, Which as she went would chirrup through the bills. Some say for her the fairest cupid pined, And looked in her face with stroke and blind. But this is true, so like was one the other, As he imagined Hera was his mother. And oftentimes into her bosom flew, About her naked neck his bare arms threw, And laid his childish head upon her breast, and with still panting rocked there took his rest. So lovely fair was Hero, Venus's nun, as nature wept, thinking she was undone, because she took more from her than she left, and of such wondrous beauty her bereft. Therefore in sign her treasure suffered rack, since Hero's time hath half the world been black. Amorous Leander, beautiful and young, Whose tragedy divine Musea sung, Dwelt in Abydos, since him dwelt there none, For whom succeeding times make greater moan, His dangling tresses that were never shorn. Had they been cut and unto Colchis born, Would have allured the venturous youth of Greece To hazard more than for just the golden fleece. Fair Cynthia wished his arms might be her sphere. Grief makes her pale, because she moves not there. Her body was as straight as Circe's wand. Jove might have sipped out nectar from his hand. Even as delicious meat is to the taste, so was his neck in touching and surpassed. The white of Pelops' shoulder I could tell ye. How smooth his breast was, and how white his belly and whose immortal fingers did imprint that heavenly path with many a curious dint that runs along his back, but my rude pen can hardly blazon forth the loves of men. Much less of powerful gods let it suffice that my slack muse sings of Leander's eyes. Those orient cheeks and lips exceeding his that leapt into the water for a kiss. Of his own shadow and despising many, died ere he could enjoy the love of any. Had wild Hippolytus Leander seen, enamored of his beauty had he been. His presence made the rudest peasants melt, that in the vast uplandish country dwelt. The barbarous Thracian soldier moved with naught, was moved with him and for his favor sought. Some swore he was a maid in man's attire, for in his looks were all that men desire. A pleasant smiling cheek, a speaking eye, a brow for love to banquet royalty. And such as knew he was a man would say, Leander, thou art made for amorous play. Why art thou not in love, and loved of all, though thou be fair, yet be not thine own thrall? The man of wealthy Sestos every year, for his sake whom the go their goddess held so dear, rose-cheeked Adonis kept a solemn feast. Thither resorted many a wandering guest, to meet their loves such as had none at all. Came lovers home from this great festival, for every street like to a firmament, glistered with breathing stars, who, where they went, frightened the melancholy earth, which deemed eternal heaven to burn, for so it seemed as if another Phaeton had got the guidance of the sun's rich chariot, 
but far above the loveliest hero shined, and stole away the enchanted gazer's mind. For like sea nymphs in vagling harmony, so was her beauty to the standers by. Nor that night wandering pale and watery star, when yawning dragons draw her thirling car. For Latmus's mount up to the gloomy sky, where crowned with blazing light and majesty, she proudly sits, moreover rules the flood, than she the hearts of those that near her stood. Even as when gaudy nymphs pursue the chase, wretched Ixion's shaggy-footed race, incensed with savage heat, gallop amain, from steep pine-bearing mountains to the plain. So ran the people forth to gaze upon her, all that viewed her were enamoured on her. And as in fury of a dreadful fight, their fellows being slain or put to flight, poor soldiers stand with fear of death dead strooken, so at her presence all surprised and tooken. Await the sentence of her scornful eyes, he whom she favours lives, the other dies. There might you see one sigh, another rage, and some their violent passions to assuage. Compile sharp satires, but alas, too late, for faithful love will never turn to hate. And many, seeing great princes were denied, pined as they went, and thinking on her died. On this feast day, O oh, cursed day and hour, went Hero through Sestos from her tower, to Venus's temple, where, unhappily, as after chance they did each other spy, so fair a church as this had Venus none. The walls were of discolored jasper stone, wherein was Proteus carved, and overhead a lively vine of green agate spread, where by one hand light-headed Bacchus hung, and with the other wine from grapes outrung. Of crystal shining fair the pavement was, the town of Sestos called it Venus's glass. There might you see the gods in sundry shapes, committing heady riots, incest rapes. For know that underneath this radiant flower was Danae's statue in brazen tower, Jove slyly stealing from his sister's bed to dally with the Dalian Ganymede. And for his love Europa bellowing loud and tumbling with the rainbow in a cloud, blood quaffing Mars heaving the iron net which limping Vulcan and his Cyclops set, love kindling fire to burn such towns as Troy, Sylvanus weeping for the lovely boy, that now is turned into a cypress tree, under whose shade the wood gods love to be, and in the midst a silver altar stood, their hero sacrificing turtle's blood, veiled to the ground, veiling her eyes close, and modestly they opened as she rose. Thence flew love's arrow with the golden head, and thus Leander was enamoured. Still stone he stood, and evermore he gazed, till with the fire that from his countenance blazed, relenting hero's gentle heart was struck. Such force and virtue hath an amorous look. It lies not in our power to love or hate, for will in us overruled by fate. When two are stripped, long ere the course begin, we wish that one should lose, the other win. And one especially do we affect, of two gold ingots like in each respect. The reason no man knows, let it suffice, what we behold is censured by our eyes, where both deliberate the love is slight, whoever loved that loved not at first sight. Ah, oh, nerds, thank you as always. That poem was so much longer than it looked when I uh, put it into this script. So apologies if it was a little long, uh, but it was uh, fun to read. And I think it's just a beautiful adaptation. And yeah, this episode is a bit unique, obviously. I wanted to tell the story of Hero Leander this week specifically because both I wanted to learn it for myself. I'd heard the name so many times but realized I didn't know the story. And because I'm speaking with this guest on Friday's episode and it features their story, though in a fascinating way that will really expand upon it so much. I can't wait for y'all to hear it. But the story is so brief and simple when you retell it in a narrative that it just doesn't span a whole episode. 
like I mentioned, the Musaius poem is so just so difficult to understand in the translations that I have. I wasn't going to subject you to a reading of it. But the Marlowe poem, on the other hand, is quite interesting and pretty. It's a perfect way to end the episode, I think, though a rare instance of me reading something to you that isn't ancient at all. I know it happened with the Cadmus and Harmonia episode too, but I promise I'm not making it a habit. Ancient is the most important, but this just fit nicely. Plus, it made the episode long enough. I've mentioned it before briefly, but I don't do many myth episodes for you anymore, unless they're just straight bonuses, because I have to put ads into my show, and I don't want to subject you all to a bunch of ads in a 20-minute episode or less. That's just mean. Anyway, that's all a bit of an excess of information, but you know me, I do like to uh, talk and explain myself for no reason, except, let's be honest, the reason is anxiety. All to say, I hope you all enjoyed this episode. I do think the background and details on how the poem became so oddly popular is just super interesting in itself, so I'm glad I got to share it with you. On Friday, I spoke with Professor Karen Carr about Hero and Leander, but specifically about swimming and how it features into the myth, and more importantly, how swimming features into fascinatingly similar myths from around the world. You're gonna love it. And next Friday, I'm just reading those heroities to you because I fucking love reading aloud. Let's Talk About Miss Baby is written and produced by me, Liv Alber. Michaela Smith is the Hermes to my Olympians and handles so many podcast-related things, from running the YouTube to creating promotional images and videos to editing and research. Stephanie Foley works to transcribe the podcast for YouTube captions and accessibility. The podcast is hosted and monetized by Acast. I am Liv, and I really love this shit quite a lot.